Rafael Campo comes from Brookline. He's a poet and an essayist who teaches and practices medicine at Harvard Medical School and Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and also on the faculty at Lesley University's Creative Writing Program. He's the recipient of numerous honors and awards, including the Guggenheim Fellowship, National Poetry Series Award, a Lambda Literary Award for Poetry, and many others. And in 2009, he received the Nicholas Davies Memorial Scholar Award for the American College of Physicians for Outstanding Humanism in Medicine. His work has also been included in a number of anthologies and in many prominent periodicals. He has published a number of books, including his latest collection of poetry titled Alternative Medicine. In an interview, Raphael spoke a bit about how he sees the art of writing and sharing poetry as it relates to healing. And he noted, Writing a poem to me is a sacred act. It is a moment of profound reverence for the mystery of our humanity. In all its unfathomable complexities, feeling the hair on the back of my neck stand up as I realize what I am trying to do. It's also an act of humility and service. Another way it's like healing, in which I give myself over to the power of the narrative itself, the acknowledgment that no poem or story is owned by one person, but instead belongs to us all. So with that, I would like to introduce Raphael to come up and to share some of his poetry, and it will be our poetry this morning. Please give him a warm welcome. As Cheryl mentioned, uh, our theme this morning is healing, and uh, I wanted to make my reading a reflection of the connections between poetry and healing. And to do that, I thought I would start with a poem that uh, will take us back to the terrible events of 9-11. And I'm sure like all of you, uh, I remember certainly where I was on that terrible morning. Uh, I was in my clinic with my patients. And I remember being struck by how they felt the need to narrate, to tell the story of what was happening on those television screens out in the waiting room. And uh, just feeling humbled by uh, the power of language uh, to help heal this collective wound we were all experiencing uh, when the medicine I had to offer that morning uh, seemed to be of very little uh, use to us. Uh, so this is a poem called The Enemy, uh, which is a, an echo, perhaps, of some of the stories and some of the uh, uh, language that my patients were, were creating uh, in, that, in that terrible moment. The Enemy. The building's wounds are what I can't forget. Though nothing could absorb my sense of loss, I stared into their blackness, what was not supposed to be there, billowing of soot and ragged maw of splintered steel, glass. The building's wounds are what I can't forget. The people dropping past them, fleeting spots approaching death as if concerned with grace. I stared into the blackness, what was not inhuman since by men's hands they were wrought. Reflected on the TV screen, my face upon the building's wounds. I can't forget this rage. I don't know what to do with it. It's in my nightmares, towers, plumes of dust, a staring in the blackness. What was not conceivable is now our every thought. We fear the enemy is all of us. The building's wounds are what I can't forget. I stared into their blackness, what was not. When I first contemplated a career in medicine, I didn't think I was a very likely candidate to succeed. And uh, I think that had to do with uh, my various identities and thinking back to that time. I first remember uh, worrying about my faith and not seeing much of a spiritual life among physicians. I thought that might be uh, a problem for me if I became a physician myself someday. 
And then, of course, was the fact of my ethnicity. And unfortunately, I didn't have many Latino role models to inspire me to have a career in medicine. So I thought that might pose its own challenges. And then, of course, was the fact uh, that I'm gay. And I hadn't really uh, experienced uh, much support from physicians uh, uh, as a gay man and worried that that might be the biggest obstacle uh, that I might face in uh, becoming a physician someday myself. And then, as it turned out, when I finally got to Harvard Medical School, it was the fact that I was a poet that was such a problem. <laughs> All these other things that I worried about turned out to be, certainly they, they, they posed some, some challenges, but, but being a poet really freaked out my, my peers and my, my colleagues. And I love to tell that story with a sense of the irony in it, because I, I can't imagine the work of healing uh, without the presence of language, the way poetry brings language uh, into, my, into my work with patients and helps me uh, really uh, reflect back to them the stories and the language that they, that they share so generously with me. So, so with that as a bit of an introduction, I'm going to read this next poem, which perhaps locates me in relation to some of these various identities and, and perhaps also begins to show one of the ways in which poetry uh, uh, is relevant to healing by, by bringing us together into uh, communities uh, and into the shared voice. Uh, so this is a poem called My Voice. To cure myself of wanting Cuban songs, I wrote a Cuban song about the need for people to suppress their fantasies, especially unhealthy ones. The song began by making reference to the sea, because the sea is like a need so great and deep, it never can be swallowed. Then the song explores some common myths about the Cuban people and their folklore. The story of a little Carib boy mistakenly abandoned to the sea. The legend of a bird who wanted song so desperately, he gave up flight. A queen whose strength was greater than a rival king's. The song goes on about morality, and then there is this line about the sea, how deep it is, how many creatures need its nourishment, how beautiful it is to need. The song is ending now because I cannot bear to hear it any longer. I call this song of needful love my voice. Now that I'm on the faculty at Harvard Medical School, one of my roles is to think about the ways in which poetry and, and literary writing and, and really the humanities in a broad sense uh, might be useful in, in medical education and in, and in modeling more empathetic, more compassionate relationships between people caring for patients and our, our patients. And um, I often have uh, feedback from my colleagues uh, that says, well, you know, we can't even really define empathy, so how are you going to teach it? And uh, my response to that is to say, well, if perhaps we can't define empathy or empathy eludes a kind of uh, facile uh, uh, definition, at the very least, I think perhaps we can model it more effectively in our work uh, with our patients on the wards. And, and I think poetry can be one way of, of modeling empathy, of showing what empathy means, uh, perhaps even without defining it. Uh, so this next poem, to my mind, is a kind of enactment or a definition of empathy and uh, perhaps another kind of argument for uh, poetry in, in the clinic, in the ward setting, in medicine. It's a poem called Iatrogenic. And iatrogenic is a term that refers to a condition that is caused by the treatment that we are uh, providing. Uh, so uh, iatrogenic. You say, I do this to myself. Outside, my other patients wait. Maybe snow falls. We're all just waiting for our deaths to come. We're all just hoping it won't hurt too much. You say, it makes it seem less lonely here. I study them as if the deep red cuts were only wounds, as if they didn't hurt so much. The way you hold your upturned arms, the cuts seem aimed at your unshaven face. Outside, my other patients wait their turns. I run gloved fingertips along their course, as if I could touch pain itself, 
as if by touching pain, I might alleviate my own despair. You say, it's snowing, Doc. The snow, instead of howling, soundlessly comes down. I think you think it's beautiful. I say, this isn't all about the snow, is it? The way you hold your upturned arms, I think about embracing you, but don't. I think we do this to ourselves. I think the falling snow explains itself to us, blinding, faceless, and so deeply wounding. Whenever I read this next poem, I'm reminded about another patient of mine who uh, really took care of me. And this is something we, I think, sometimes fail to recognize in medicine and our daily work, how much our patients actually take care of us. And, um, and so I wrote a poem about that because I think uh, poetry, another function of poetry in, in, in the world of healing is to help us get outside of our usual boxes and to, and to think about those kinds of um, unexpected aspects of the work that we do. Um, so this is a poem uh, about a patient of mine, and I'll never, I'll never forget him. He was about five years old, and um, I was taking care of him during my uh, pediatrics rotation, and I got called in the middle of the night to put an IV into him, and um, I gather all my stuff, and I trudged over to his bed and uh, tried to put the IV in, and I missed the first time, and I tried again, missed the second time. The nurse is looking at me from the doorway saying, you know, this incompetent intern, when is he going to get this IV in? And, uh, you know, as I continue to flail and try to get this IV in, he looks up at me with these huge eyes and says, doctor, don't worry, you're doing a really good job. <laughs> so I'll never forget that, and, and I'll never forget him. And so this, this poem is uh, a way of always, of, of always remembering him. It's called Age Five, Born with AIDS. In Jaime's picture of the world, a heart as big as South America shines out, the center of the only ocean. Three stick figures, one is labeled me, are drawn beside the world as if such suffering could make us more objective. Jaime is bald and has no mouth. His parents aren't like him. They're all red lips and crazy yellow hair and grins. There is no title for his work of art, except the names we give ourselves. I thought I would read um, one other poem uh, that relates to HIV and AIDS. Uh, as you, many of you know, we uh, just marked another uh, World AIDS Day a few, a few days ago. And um, I gave a reading, actually, at Oberlin College, a, a couple of years back in connection with World AIDS Day, and afterwards one of the students came up to me and said, oh, I think it's so great that you're still writing about AIDS now that, now that you know, we're really post-emergency and, and we have a cure. And I thought, my goodness, you know, this is another reason we need poetry and medicine, is to sort of debunk the, the myth of our, our power uh, uh, to cure illnesses we can't cure. We, we wish we could, of course, but and we have certainly made tremendous advances, but... Uh, but, uh, but poetry perhaps can, can still heal in, in the face of the lack of a cure or perhaps in the face of indifference uh, when we reach a point where we feel we uh, no longer need to, to feel uh, urgency about these kinds of uh, problems. 40 million people in this world uh, have HIV, most of whom will die of the infection because of lack of access to the medicines that we have to treat it. So this is uh, a poem called uh, Swim for Life, um, which reminds us, I hope, that uh, we still need to find a cure. Crowds throng the creaking boardwalk to sign up to swim from Long Point back to Provincetown, a fundraiser for AIDS and women's groups. Three seagulls levitate, then spiral down. The atmosphere is festive, jovial, a touch irreverent, we're all still here. The sun is glorious. And after all, these aging men in speedos bear the scars, these women in their wetsuits just as brave. 
Old disco anthems pulsate as they stretch and limber up, the glittering of waves that lap in time along the pebbled beach, a drag queen's overdone green eyeshadow. A stiff breeze riffles through the many names on prayer ribbons draped above. For Joe, I glimpse on one. I miss you, Mary Jane, entreats another. Soon it's time. I watch the swimmers gather, board the launches, fade to tiny dots, like drifts of stars just out of reach, like friendships that were suddenly unmade, like memories we never thought we'd have. The ocean swallows them. We're quiet, stunned by what heroic acts can still achieve. From death, reclaim what's human, save what's loved. Uh, whenever I read these next poems, people will say, or used to say, oh, those poems you read towards the end remind me of that television show, and usually it was ER. Um, now it's House, I guess, or one of the other ones. And, and uh, I always have to say for the record that these poems were written well before any of those shows aired and were really written with a different um, impulse, I think. I, I was trying in these poems to... Uh, honor the dignity of some of the patients I've cared for, rather than to glamorize the doctor's role in, in um, the experience of healing. So, so this is a, um, a series of poems. They're sort of broken sonnets. They're love poems uh, for some of my patients. And I'll just, I'll just read a few of them for you this morning. Uh, the sequence of poems is called Ten Patients and Another. Mrs. G, the patient is a 60-odd-year-old white female who presents with fever, cough, and shaking chills. No further history could be elicited. She doesn't speak. The patient's social history was non-contributory. Someone left her here. The intern on the case heard crackles in both lungs. An EKG was done, which showed a heart was beating in the normal <coughs> sinus rhythm, except for an occasional dropped beat. An intravenous line was placed. The intern found a bruise behind her ear. She then became quite agitated and began to sob without producing tears. We think she's dry. She's resting quietly on Haldol, waiting for her bed upstairs. Jamal. The patient is a three-year-old black male the full-term product of a pregnancy that was, according to his grandmother, unplanned and may be complicated by prenatal alcohol exposure. Did okay, developmentally delayed but normal weights and heights until last week when he ingested what's turned out to be cocaine, according to the lab results. His grandmother had said she'd seen him with some baby powder on his face and hands before he started seizing, and they brought him in. The vital signs have stabilized. The nurse is getting DSS involved. The mom? She left it on the kitchen table. That's her, the one who sings to him all night. Kelly. The patient is a 12-year-old white female. She's gravita zero, no STDs. She'd never even had a pelvic. One month, nausea and vomiting. No change in bowel habits. No fever, chills, malaise. Her school performance has been worsening. She states that things at home are fine. On physical exam, she cried but was cooperative. Her abdomen was soft with normal bowel sounds in question of a suprapubic mass, which was non-tender. Her pelvic was remarkable for scars at six o'clock, no hymen visible, some uterine enlargement. Pregnancy tests positive times two. She says it was her dad. He's sitting in the waiting room. SW. Extending from her left ear down her jaw, the lack was seven centimeters long. She told me that she slipped and struck her face against the kitchen floor. 
The floor was wet because she had been mopping it. I guess she'd had to wait for many hours since the clock read nearly midnight. Who mops floors so late? Her little girl kept screaming in her husband's thick, impatient arms. He knocked three times, each time to ask when we'd be done. I infiltrated first with lidocaine. She barely winced and didn't start to cry until the 16th stitch went in and we were almost through. I thought my handiwork was admirable. I yawned, then offered her instructions on the care of wounds. She left. Manuel. In Trauma 1, a gay Latino kid, I think he's 17, is getting tubed for respiratory failure. Sleeping pills and Tylenol I translated for him as he was wheeled in. His novio explained that when he told his folks about it all, they threw him out, like trash. They lived together underneath the overpass of Highway 101 for seven weeks, the stars obstructed from their view. For cash, they sucked off older men in Cadillacs. A viejita from the neighborhood brought tacos to them secretly. Last night, with 18 wheelers roaring overhead, he whispered that he'd lost his will to live. He pawned his crucifix to get the pills. Jane Doe, number two. They found her unresponsive in the street. Beneath a lamplight, I imagine, made her seem angelic, regal even, clean. She must have been around 16. She died who knows how many hours earlier that day the heroine inside her like a vengeful dream about to be fulfilled. Her hands were crossed about her chest as though raised up in self-defense. I tried to pry them open to confirm the absence of her heartbeat, but in death she was so strong, as resolute as she was beautiful. I traced the track marks on her arms instead, then pressed my thumb against her bloodless lips so urgent was my need to know. I felt the quiet left by a departing soul. Um, I'm gonna close by reading one very short uh, excerpt from an essay. Um, I hope I've given you a sense of the connections between poetry and healing uh, in my own experience and, uh, and the value of of the humanities of literary writing and of poetry specifically in, in uh, the work of physicians and other care providers. Um, but this little excerpt of an essay from an essay called AIDS and the Poetry of Healing, I think um, says, says it a bit more explicitly. Um, so I wanna thank you all for your attention and I'll just close with these last couple of paragraphs. Um, in poetry are present the fundamental beating contents of the body at peace the regularity of resting brainwave activity in contrast to the disorganized spiking of a seizure, the gentle ebb and flow of breathing or sobbing in contrast to the harsh spasmodic cough, the single-voiced ringing chant of a slogan at an act-up rally in contrast to the indecipherable rumblings of AIDS funding debate on the Senate floor. The poem is a physical process, is bodily exercise, rhymes become the mental resting places in the ascending rhythmic stairway of memory. The poem, perhaps, is an idealization or a dream of the physical, the imagined healthy form. Yet it does not renounce illness. Rather, it reinterprets it as the beginning point for healing. I wonder, then, whether poetry might also be therapeutic. Many of my friends, especially some of my colleagues in medicine, have teased me for believing in the curative power of words, joking that I should write some doggerel on my prescriptions instead of the names of medications and directions for their use. <laughs> if poetry is made of breath or the beating heart, then surely it's not unreasonable to think it might reach those places in the bodies of its audience, however rarefied. Moreover, I joke back, I have never seen a poem cause fulminant liver failure or bone marrow toxicity, even a really bad one. <laughs> 
putting the mouth to words, and by incantation returning regular rhythms to the working lungs. These were the principles by which ancient healers in Native American cultures practiced their art. The Egyptians gave their dead a book full of charms and spells to be used in the afterlife. Might not poetry then facilitate the passing to another realm? Poetry is a pulsing, organized imagining of what once was, or is to be, what life once was, what life is to be. It is ampules of the purest, clearest drug of all, the essence and distillation of the process of living itself. Thank you very much. Now we will count to 12 and we will all keep still for once on the face of the earth. Let's not speak in any language. Let's stop for a second and not move our arms too much. It would be exotic moment without rush, without engines. We would all be together in a sudden strangeness. Fishermen in the coal sea would not harm the whales and the man gathering salt would not hurt his hands. Those who prepare green wars, wars with gas, wars with fire, victories with no survivors, would put on clean clothes and walk about with their brothers in the shade, doing nothing. What I want should not be confused with total inactivity. Life is what it is about. If we were not so single-minded about keeping our lives moving and for once could do nothing, perhaps a huge silence might interrupt the sadness of never understanding ourselves and of threatening ourselves with death. Perhaps the earth can teach us when everything seems to be dead in winter and later proves to be alive. Now I'll count to 12 and you keep quiet and I will go.